All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, on behalf of the Venastra Community Christian Forum Church Council. I'd like to welcome everyone here. Um, a bunch of really great announcements in the bulletin today. I'll highlight a few of them. Um, so first off, just uh, looking for drivers for Debbie Teeter to have her joining us uh, for worship again Sunday morning. And if you're able to help out with that, please contact uh, Fran. Um, next week is going to be a really busy week. A reminder that we will be having a potluck um, and saying farewell and wishing all the best uh, and God's blessing on the DeWeird family as as they head off. Uh, also, there will be, after the potluck, a chance for kind of a, an open mic, wishing them well and, and giving words of blessing and shared experiences at one o'clock. Um, and there's cake there, too. Uh, also, there is the baptism for uh, Isla next week, so keep that in mind as well. Um, also, volunteers, we're looking for help with children's messages and potentially some reading sermons as we move into this time of transition. So if you're able to help out with that, please contact uh, the council clerk. Um, greeter and cleanup duties, we're excited to have those coming back. Um, please watch for the list, and if you would like not to be a part of that, then please also let uh, Kelly know so that you're not put in that position if you if you don't want to. Um, and then today we're going to be drawing names and uh, God willing we'll be installing office bearers next week. So just continue to keep that process in your prayers. Um, I believe that's everything. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Oops. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. We thank you that we can freely gather together to worship your name as a family of believers, to walk alongside one another and to just come together to know you more. We pray that as we gather together this morning, you will quiet our minds and open our hearts, that we might be prepared to take in the message that you have put on Pastor Paul's heart and that we will grow and, and work in your kingdom here. Just, we pray that everything that is said and done will be to your praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. It is good to be here together, gathered together to worship to praise and to honor our God. And as we gather together, we hear words of a call to worship, a call inviting us to come and gather in worship. I invite you to rise as we hear these words. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 100, where the psalmist writes and says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. As we gather here this morning, all different generations, ranging from those in their 90s to those who have yet to hit a year. We come together to remember God's goodness, His faithfulness, to bring praise and honor and glory to Him. And as we come, we're reminded that our God is here with us, and He welcomes and greets us. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And I invite you to turn and say a good morning to those here worshiping with you. Good morning.
We move now in our service to a time of confession. And when we gather together in worship, we gather in the holy presence of God as we have just sung of our holy, holy, holy God. One of the things that happens is when we think of God's faithfulness, His never-ending love, His righteousness, in light of His faithfulness, in light of His righteousness, we also come face to face with our own humanity. Our own humanity is laid bare where when we stand in the presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. And so we come this morning recognizing that each and every one of us has been unfaithful to our God, that each and every one of us has offered falsehood instead of truth in some way, shape, or form. And so we come before our God seeking to confess our unfaithfulness, seeking to confess our own falsehood and our own brokenness. People of God, we come before our God and acknowledge who we are, broken people. And we ask our ever-present God our God who lo- whose love endures forever to forgive us. So we come now in a time of confession. I invite you to bow your heads with me. Merciful God, we confess, Lord, that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. Lord, you have set us apart as a people who are dearly loved, and Lord, you have called us to be a light to this world, to love, honor, and glorify you in all that we, we do. You've called us, Lord, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to tell them of the love and grace that we have received, the same love and grace that you offer to them. Yet, yeah, Lord, we can be embarrassed, we can be afraid, we can be shy, we can come up with all sorts of excuses, reasons 
as to why we cannot or should not reach out. Not now, not this person, not in this place. And yet, God, all those are is excuses. Lord, we long to be your faithful people. We long to learn, love, and serve and honor you more fully each and every day. So we come before you, Lord, confessing our sins, recognizing our shortcomings, laying them at your feet and crying out to you, Lord, have mercy. Forgive us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come before God, recognize our own brokenness, we also come not fearful of God's judgment, not fearful of His wrath, but we come in hope, in trust. We hear assurance of our pardon, and we hear these words from Psalm 100 and three as our words of assurance that make us know of his forgiveness. This is what it says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our iniquities or our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. People of God, we are broken we fall, we take missteps, but our God is loving, compassionate, merciful. He removes our sins from us and forgives us in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. And so we join now in singing of our God who is wonderful magnificent and marvelous. I invite you to rise as we sing a song of thanksgiving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
apologize <laughs> you may be seated thankfully the Lord forgives <laughs> at this time we continue in our service moving now to a time where we are preparing to draw names for office bearers and for those visiting with us, this has been a process we've been prayerfully engaged in for a little over a month already. As we walk through these processes and we figure out the steps of what it takes to find new leaders within the church, new elders and deacons, one of the things that we want to make sure we, we don't forget is that it is a prayer-filled practice, a prayer-filled process where for months people have been considering the gifts of others in this congregation. And it is always so uplifting to see the sheer size of lists of names of people in our church who are recognized as having gifts, gifts to lead as elder, gifts to lead as deacons, and other members nominate them. And we don't always get to hear that. And then letters go out, and we don't know who all receives these letters, but people prayerfully consider that nomination, send it back in. Some of them saying, I don't feel called to lead in this office at this time. And oftentimes it's connected to ways they are already engaged in ministry, ways they're already using their gifts. And that too is beautiful. Something to celebrate, that the office of elder and deacon are not the only places we use our gifts in the church. We use them through all manner of different acts of service and ministry. And so that too is just a wonderful time of hearing the ways that our church community are using their gifts. And then we have last week where we Vote and affirm the gifts of those nominated who are letting their names stand. And that too is a time where it's more than simply checking off the names that we affirm gifts in. It's us affirming the gifts of these nominated members. It's us saying, yes, we see God at work in your life equipping you for these offices. And then this morning we come and having done all of that, we place those names who are nominated, who are affirmed into a couple of little felt bags and we have our outgoing office bearers come up and they draw those names. We trust that as a final act of once again lifting up these names, each and every one of them, equipped, readied to serve God and say, God, who do you have in mind for this congregation? at this time, over this next period. And so, before I invite our outgoing elder and deacon in Brian and Jake um, up, we're just going to bow our heads in a moment of prayer, once again, lifting this whole process up to him in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, what a gift to live together in Christian community, to be a church family, God, what a gift to be a church family made up of so many wonderful, beautiful, unique, individual people. God, what a gift to be able to see the different skill sets and natural gifts that you have placed within this congregation, within this church family. God, we thank you for those who have felt the call to let their names stand for the offices of elder and of deacon. God, we thank you for those we've affirmed your giftedness in. God, as we now prepare to draw names for the role of elder and deacon, we pray, Lord, that those names drawn 
that they would be uplifted and thankful, excited and ready for the calling that is being placed on them to lead this church over the next few years alongside the rest of the council. God, for those names that remain unpicked, we pray that, Lord, you would show them where you have a calling for them over this next year, in the days ahead. ahead. Whether it's a calling toward a season of rest, a calling toward a season of ministering in a different part of this congregation. God, we pray that this process, that this time would be led by your Spirit's leading. That, Lord, you would strengthen and encourage each and every one of us as we see these leaders emerge among us and as we are reminded of the ways that each and every one of us continue to use our gifts as a part of this church family. God, we thank you for this time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, I would like to invite Brian and Jake forward. We're going to switch to this one. Do you remember which bag is which? Elders or deacons? That's deacons. All right, yeah. It doesn't really matter which one we do first. So, Jake is pulling two names. We are drawing for two names of L or deacons. So, Tim Wubbs. Okay, so, this is kind of odd that, you know, we could applaud, but we'll save that for after and thankfulness for each and every person. Justin Damsma. Okay, and you could just put them back in, that's fine. So Tim Wubbs and Justin Dampsma, and for Elder, Leo Gerdanis. Leo Gerdanis. And so now it's fitting, I think, a round of applause for those who are going. Back to mine. And so as we draw these names, Leo, Justin, Tim, preparing to enter into a season of leading in the formal offices of deacon and elder in the church, uh, we also move to a time where we remember those who are outgoing. So Brian and Jake, you both have served as leaders in your own right in different ways in different portions of council. Uh, Jake is leaving as our chair of council. Brian as our chair of elders. Um, you guys have walked through an interesting season for councils. We'll leave it at that. It has been tiring and stressful and wearisome. And you have led well. You've led with patience. You've led with wisdom. We've had some hiccups and some bumps that we have had to figure out along the way. We're not perfect. Um, so I want to thank Brian and Jake for your leadership. And so I think also it's fitting for a round of applause and thanks for them too. We are thankful for the gifts of leadership that God provides here in his church. Um, at this time, I want to invite our children forward for our children's message. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Wow, that was really good right away, but I still think you could be louder. Good morning. Wow, I'm awake now. Um, hey, I was awake before, and that's probably a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. I had a question. Do you guys know what we just did right now? Yeah, we got a new elder and deacon, or new elder and deacons. Yeah. 
And how do we do that? Yeah, Emma. Drawing names. And why do you think we draw names? Yeah, Emma. So it's fair. Yep. Other thoughts? Cashman. So it's random. Yeah. Why do you think we would want it to be random? Yeah, Mia. That's right. Then the people whose names aren't picked, because did you know those bags up there that we pulled names out of, there's other names in there. And have you guys ever been picked for like playing a game or a team before? Have you ever had that where you line up and everyone picks teams? No? Okay. And what do, what do you think, what does it feel like when you're not picked sometimes? Yeah, Emma. Disappointing. Disappointing and sad. But one of the things that we talk about when we do this, when we pick names for elders and deacons, we don't want the people whose names weren't picked to be sad or disappointed. Because one of the things I, I was talking about earlier is there's lots of other ways that people get to help and serve in the church, right? What are some of the ways that you guys see other adults helping in the church? Can you guys think of any? Leah. Sunday school and nursery? Opening doors? Yeah. Right, if someone missed and wasn't here for nursery and someone else steps in? Others. Do you guys get juice after church now? Yeah. Do you think that juice just poof shows up on Sunday morning? No, no not quite. No, it's not magical apple juice. No. I, yeah. All right, all right, all right. What about what about singing and playing instruments? Do those just happen randomly? No. Someone helps with that. What about do you think when you look out here at all these adults, do you think there's people doing stuff that we don't even see? Yeah? yeah. yeah. No. Like praying for us? Like maybe cleaning when we're not here? Maybe preparing for some of those lessons? Or planning schedules of who's going to be in nursery or play music? There are so many ways we serve in the church and so even though there's some names this morning that weren't picked, there's still lots of different places that God can use them. And do you know what's the craziest part of it? Even for you guys as kids, some of those things we heard about this morning that you guys were saying are ways that other adults help. Each and every one of you guys gets to help do sometimes too. Do you guys ever help in Sunday school? Help do maybe part of the readings or the lessons? Do you guys ever hold doors open for people? Do you guys ever pour juice for someone else if they can't quite reach it? Yeah. There's so many ways that you guys, too, are also helpers in the church. And so this morning, part of what we did is we prayed and we said, God, we thank you for all the gifts, all the skills and the strengths that you've given to this whole church. Because every person out here they all have strengths and death gifts. And every single one of them, do you think there's any of them that have exactly the same gifts as the next person? No. no way. Same with you guys. All of us are different. And God makes us different. But he gives us space and opportunity to serve in different ways. And it's so awesome when we get to do that as a church family and we all get to use our gifts and our strengths and we grow and we serve each other all together. And so this morning, when we do this just simple drawing of names, that can remind us that God has given every one of us gifts and that God is calling each and every one of us to serve and honor and praise Him. Now, this morning, I want to ask all of you to help me regardless of what your gifts are, and we are going to help serve and lead all the rest of these fine folks in singing and 
dancing, or actions. So, you guys are going to stand. I'm going to try. If you guys know the actions of Days of Elijah, and there might be some people out here who will surprise you. All right. And we're all going to rise with the children. Let's sing. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sorrow, so we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, running on the clouds, shining trumpet call, lift your voice, you to bleed, out of science till salvation comes, behold he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, you to bleed, out of science till salvation and we may be seated. And as our children go and continue in their worship together, we also continue in ours, preparing to open God's Word together preparing to hear God's word together. And just as we do so, let's bow our heads for a prayer for illumination. God, our Heavenly Father, it is amazing that you speak into our lives, that you, Lord, the creator of the world, who spoke things into being, would speak in ways that lead and guide and direct our lives each and every day. God, as we open your word, we pray that we would have hearts and minds ready to receive the things that you are leading us toward, ready to hear and listen well, ready to meditate and chew on the things that you are revealing to us in your word. God, we thank you for this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we are going to be opening up and reading from two different scripture texts. First, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15, and then we'll be going back in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 to 5. So Matthew 6, 5 to 15, and 2 Kings 20, verses 1 to 5. We'll begin in Matthew chapter 6, and this is what it says. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, 
will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And then moving back in our scriptures to 2 Kings chapter 20, starting at verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. As we hear these words this morning, we hear two texts, both of them connected through a focus on prayer. And this morning, that is what we are going to be focusing on together. Prayer. What is prayer? And if you're visiting with us, we're going to be doing this as a part of our series that we've been focusing on. We've been going through a series over the last few weeks titled Devoted Church, where we've used Acts chapter 2, verse 42, as an outline, a template for thinking about what we are called to as the body of believers, as the church. Because in Acts 2, 42, it says that the early believers had a, a fourfold for focus on their time of gathering together. That they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And we've been going through those, hearing how first being devoted to the apostles' teaching reminds us that we're devoted to testimony of who God is. That a part of the church's calling is to be a people who listen. Who listen to God's revelation of Himself through His Word and through His world and through the ways that He is testified about in the lives of other believers. So the church is called to listen. And then we talked about how we're called to be devoted to fellowship, koinonia, literally doing life together. That we are called to walk with each other through life. And so the church is called to gather, to come together, to be together. And then last week we looked at how the church is called to be devoted to the breaking of bread, to eat together, to gather at the table, to remind each other of how God provides for our earthly needs in the food that is before them, but how they are also reminded that in that breaking of the bread, we remember Jesus' body broken and God's provision, not just for the here and now, but His provision for all our needs for salvation in Jesus Christ. So the church is called 
to listen, to gather, to eat and remember. And now the fourth one is they were devoted to prayer. The church is called to be a body who prays. But as we think about prayer and look into our texts this morning, I think it's important if we first talk about what exactly prayer is. Because there are different approaches. There are different ways that we pray. For some, prayer is often very similar to the genie in Aladdin. Rub the lamp and ask for your wishes, right? And that's what prayer is. We have access to God, so we bow on our knees and we ask God for all of our wishes, all of our wants, all of our desires. For many, that's what prayer is. For others, it's eerily similar to a complaints department. Let's go to God in prayer and tell Him how broken this world is and ask Him to fix it. And that's how we pray. There are different ways of approaching prayer. But this morning, I think as we unpack and think about prayer, one of the things that I hope we can recognize is that prayer isn't so much something where we go and we seek to get something. That prayer isn't something where we seek to ask for our wishes and receive something. Or prayer isn't something where we go and we ask for something to be fixed and we receive that. We, we don't pray to get something, but we pray to get to know someone. Prayer is an act of building relationship with God. It's an act of communication that includes both us speaking and reaching out, and also us listening and receiving a word from the Lord. That prayer is an act of building that relationship, and I think we'll see that as we look in our texts this morning. We begin in Matthew chapter 6, and of course in, of course in Matthew chapter 6, we hear in this text, the Lord's Prayer, a familiar prayer that probably many, if not all of us, have memorized along with millions of people around the world throughout history, knowing these familiar words. But this morning, that's not the portion of this text we're going to focus on. If you want to know more about the Lord's Prayer, about what it all contains, about what those phrases mean, I would invite you, go check out the Heidelberg Catechism. It goes through line by line with scriptural references talking about the beauty and the depth of the Lord's Prayer. But that would be for another day and another sermon series. This morning what I want to focus on is chap- verses 5 to 8, the context, the build-up to Jesus inviting his followers and those gathered there to pray that Lord's Prayer. Because what Jesus talks about in verses 5 to 8 is these different views of prayer, these different approaches. And Jesus doesn't really sugarcoat things. He doesn't leave them kind of unnamed. He says, when you pray, do not pray like the hypocrites. And here it comes, I'm going to tell you what a hypocrite's prayer looks like. It says they stand in the synagogue. They stand on the street corners. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to make a show of this prayer that they are praying. But I tell you, they've received their reward in full. They're acknowledged. Their, their sense of being acknowledged as one who's out there and praying loud, vocal, visible, public. That is their reward in their prayer. But then he sets it in contrast to his instruction, to his followers. He says, but when you pray, go into your house, go into your room, close the door, and in the secret, in the quiet, in the place unseen, in a space unheard by others, there pray in private. And we see this layout happening. Hypocritical prayer out in the public to be seen, to be heard, to be vocal, to be visible. Private prayer in the secret, in the quiet. And he says, and your Father who is unseen will reward you. 
your Father who knows what is done in secret will reward you. So we already see this division being laid out. The visible, vocal, out there prayer that's more showy versus the hidden, the unknown, the unseen. But then he builds on it again. He says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans do. Again, very clearly, do we want to be hypocrites and pagans? No. But he's not hiding that. Don't babble on because the pagans think that their many words or their fancy words, their ornate words are going to make their prayer heard all the more. Don't pray like that. Your Father who knows everything, knows what you need, go to Him and pray. And then He gives the words of the Lord's Prayer. Succinct, short, all-encompassing prayer. Don't babble on. Don't make it more than it needs to be. Don't be showy. Don't be out there. But let your prayer be intimate, be vulnerable, be straight to the point in a space where others don't need to hear, others don't need to see. Let that be your prayer. And I think if we're thinking of prayer in terms of an act of building relationship with God, that makes complete sense sense that our call to prayer would be one to go to the secret place where we can be vulnerable where we can be honest where we can can be open before our God in prayer because if we think about building relationship in our own lives in the day to day how many of you who are here and have lived in relationship Maybe you're married, you're dating, you're a son, a daughter, a child, a parent. How many of those relationships were built by yelling at each other over a crowd out in a public place? Is that where your relationship was forged? Out and about, inviting everyone to know every little detail of what's going on? I sure hope not. (laughs) Right? Our relationships, lifelong, lasting relationships are forged when we can be vulnerable with each other, when we can be honest, when we can be intimate, when we can share in relationship together in a way that is unseen by the masses. That what people see is really just the tip of the iceberg of the depth of where our relationship goes. So of course, if prayer is our act of building relationship with God, of getting to know God, And of course it's going to be an act that's vulnerable, that's intimate. It's probably unseen for the most part to the masses. I think in our second text, in 2 Kings chapter 20, we see an example of that very relationship being forged and growing in the person of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is on his deathbed. He's deathly ill. He's sick. More than that, God speaks to Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah and says, Hezekiah, get your things in order. You will not recover this. You are going to die. And in that moment, we hear in our text, Hezekiah turns. He turns to the wall turns away from those with him. And he prays. A vulnerable, intimate prayer. Praying, God, you know I've been your faithful servant. You know I serve you wholeheartedly. God, heal me. And he weeps bitterly. He lets out his emotions. He lays them there. And as Isaiah is leaving, before he can leave, he receives a word from the Lord again saying, go back, go back to Hezekiah. Let him know the word of the Lord. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. You will be healed. And Hezekiah is given 15 more years of life. Hezekiah prays and weeps bitterly not so others will know it, 
not so others will see it, but in his own act of vulnerability, desperation we might even call it, of speaking plainly and honestly to his God whom he loves and he has served wholeheartedly. And God hears his prayer. And so when we gather together this morning and we think about prayer, what prayer is, what prayer looks like, I think we start to see it's not meant to be showy. It's not meant to be extreme poetic language that has to be well written and rehearsed. It's meant to be raw, vulnerable, honest. A step in building relationship with God. And one of the odd things is as we think about prayer this morning, we're doing so in the context, in the frame of hearing that the early fellowship of believers, the early church, that they were devoted to prayer, not just individually, but together. And so what does that mean? If prayer is this intimate, vulnerable, secret, hidden, tucked away thing, what does it mean for a church, a community, to be devoted to prayer together? Well, last week, we looked at the breaking of bread. And I had mentioned that many scholars think that the breaking of bread is actually a subcategory, a sub area of focus underneath fellowship. That a part of doing life together, a part of being devoted to fellowship, includes breaking bread together, eating together. Well, those same scholars think that prayer is also one of those subcategories. That prayer, too, and the devotion to prayer in the early church was a part of their fellowship. Their gathering together. Their doing life together. That, in fact, Acts 2, 42 has really two areas of focus. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. And then in fellowship, that includes breaking bed together and prayer together. But if prayer together is understood, if prayer is understood as this act of building relationship with God, of seeking to be vulnerable, to be honest, to be open toward God. And fellowship is this act of drawing together to be gathered and built and to do life together. And I don't think it takes long for us to take a step and understand that a part of our calling as church is to be a people who are vulnerable, who are open, who are honest, before God, yes, as we seek to know Him more, but also with each other before God, as we seek to support each other, to encourage each other, to carry each other's burdens, to lift each other up in prayer. A part of that includes our act of seeking to be vulnerable, open, and honest with those we worship with with those we walk alongside, as we grow in koinonia and fellowship and doing life together, part of that includes praying honestly, openly. Not in showy words, not in fancy ways, not shouting from the rooftops, but gathering together, being vulnerable, being open, being honest, and laying that out before God together. Because we build relationship, yes, with God, but also with each other as we grow in our knowledge of God. And so this morning, as we are here gathered, the church family, a people who are called to listen, to gather, to eat, to pray, we're going to take some time and focus on our call to be a people who pray together. Now that might raise some anxieties in a few of you as you hear that last minute. But here's the thing. As we've heard in Matthew 6, God already knows your heart. He knows what you need. You don't have to worry about saying the right thing or the wrong thing. He knows what you need. You don't have to worry 
about whether you said enough or too little. So what I'm going to invite you to do is to find three or four people seated by you. For those joining with us online, whoever is there with you, gather together. We're going to take a couple minutes to pray. And there's no format to this prayer. There isn't one person has to open, one has to close. I want you simply to share together what is on your heart, what is on your mind. Lift that up to God. He knows already, but just lay it out there. Whatever is truly on your heart, whatever is weighing on you, lift it up to those here worshiping with you in an act of seeking to be honest, to be open, to be vulnerable before God with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So I invite you now, find a group of four or five, spend just a couple minutes naming the things on your heart. And again, there's no format. There's no right or wrong way. Entrust it to God, and then we will come back and join in singing a song of response. Let's spend time in prayer together.
Shall we stand together? morning. We have two offerings this morning. The first is for church ministries and the second is for Room to Grow. Room to Grow is a Christian pregnancy and parenting support center in Clinton. Let's pray. Gracious God, use this money and all that we have for the, this building, for the building up of your work in this church and the wider community for your glory. Amen.
As we prepare to leave this place, this time of worship together, we go into lives of worship. We go with the opportunity to praise and honor and glorify our God every step of the way. And we go knowing that we do not go alone, that our God is with us every step of the way. I invite you to rise as we receive our parting blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught. Sun for bed to shine.